Hi, this is Steve Pargadon, and welcome to our early afternoon keynote. <laughs> we have just an abundance of great keynotes this conference. This is the Reinventing the Classroom conference, our first ever. I'm still trying to um, help uh, many school reformers in the United States uh, embrace it. Uh, actually, it's a term that um, Vicki Davis, I believe, um, invented. And I believe Vicki was with you yesterday. Is that correct, Steve? She was talking about reinventing writing. She's a, she spins ideas off like the rest of us doodle. Uh, you know, it is, a, uh, it is a lovely word. Thanks to ClassFlow for sponsoring this event. Go to classflow.com. Give them some appreciation for making this event for free and check out their cool product. Thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for this oh so stable platform that has done us so well. Those of you who are in our live audience, you can now indicate where you're participating from, look to the left of the map. The second icon down is a star. Double click on it and then click on the map. If your city, country, in the chat if you would as well, that's lots of fun. That's pretty cool. And that's Flood City in Pensacola. Is there somebody really west of South America there? <laughs> Abigail, our gem catcher, suggests in a boat. Fun to have someone from South America, Paraguay. Yeah, if your star isn't where you want, just move it to another location and click. Vienna, Austria. That's fun. Anyway, you can keep putting those notes in the chat. Right now, I'm going to turn the time over to you. Let us know how we can help you. We're with you for the duration. And if you need uh, Q and A at the end, we can guide you on that as well. And your microphone is not on, so we see your lips moving, but we don't hear anything. Oh, uh, hopefully you can hear me now. Yes. There uh, you go. Thank you. I just inadvertently hit the off button. Um, great to be back with you, Steve, and to have a conversation with um, um, fabulous educators around this concept, teacherpreneur, which I mentioned earlier, a word we believe um, was um, invented by Vicki Davis, uh, and a word that we really glommed on to a few years ago in writing our book, uh, Teaching 2030. And we had a lovely session around the um, major concepts of that book, uh, Steve, some years back. and. Now we have a new book uh, where we've actually tried to actualize what a teacherpreneur is and fund and support now 17 uh, of these expert classroom practitioners who lead without leaving the classroom, um, who have time and space and reward to incubate and execute their own ideas. So, but before I start with just a few thoughts about why teacherpreneurs are so important and give perhaps a few examples of uh, the 17 uh, that we've mentioned, that I just mentioned, uh, and what they've accomplished and how they've reinvented the classroom. I would love for the 20, well, since I'm one of the 23 folks in the room here, uh, the other 22 of you, if you don't mind, just take one minute or so and throw a couple of words uh, of thoughts in the classroom, I mean, excuse me, from your perspective uh, in the chat box about how you believe um, uh, teacherpreneurs uh, can uh, reinvent uh, the classroom. 
So can I can we just take about a minute and let me see what you guys have to say and then hopefully I'll be smart enough to build some of my remarks off of um, your thoughts. Good point, Peggy. Yes. Well, these are all great characteristics of, uh, of teacher entrepreneurs, and they are um, most likely um, um, characteristics of any excellent teacher. Um, however, um, the teacher entrepreneur, um, I'm going to suggest, is not only fearless and are risk takers, uh, but they have support. Uh, and a mechanism to systematically spread their ideas uh, and their best practices and their, their thoughts about what good policy is beyond their classroom, beyond their school, beyond their district, beyond their state, and in the case of uh, several teachers with whom we're working now are teacher entrepreneurs even beyond the country of the United States. So what I'd love to do, thank you for your, your thoughts, everyone, um, is suggest um, something kind of um, outrageous, uh, that by the year 2030, which is now only 16 years uh, from, to, uh, from where we are now, um, uh, we should have 600,000 teacherpreneurs, uh, teachers in hybrid roles uh, who teach children regularly, either daily or or every other day, or some portion, a sizable portion of the week, but have that time and space and reward to incubate and execute their own ideas. The reason we came up with the number 600,000 uh, for our book, Teaching 2030, again, the term uh, Vicki uh, created some years back, is because there are about, in the United States, approximately literally of 7 million educators who are credentialed. But most of them are not teachers. Uh, less than half of them are teachers. And we believe strongly that if we are going to even get close to serving kids um, in the year 2014, much less in the year, year, year 2030, we need more classroom experts who have daily contact with kids or regular contacts with kids, parents, and communities to be driving more of the system, and that they have the time, as I've already suggested, uh, to incubate and execute their ideas with the resources that are, are necessary. Uh, in our book, uh, to kind of set the stage for, in our book, Teaching 2030, to set the stage for this, uh, we uh, thought about several emergent realities, which, um, for the most part, um, demanded a new brand of leadership from the classroom. And I will say this, with new data that, or new polling data that has just surfaced of late, that 84% of America's teachers do not want to be principals, and 75% of America's principals say that their job is too complex. Indeed, it is too complex today. And just think how much more complicated schooling is going to be when we actually do use our digital tools, our handhelds, and the like. Uh, and use social media in ways that many of you, I'm sure, are already using in your classrooms with your kids to help them explicate knowledge and spread it. And we have more and more teachers who are driving uh, their classroom instruction upon increasing research evidence around how humans learn and how young people learn. When we have that type of transformed learning ecology for students and teachers, we need more teachers, as Steve might say, I suspect, uh, who are less the sage on the stage and more teachers who are the, what I would call the learning architect. But we also need teachers who are brokers beyond the classroom, uh, beyond their school, because the second emergent reality speaks to how we need more seamless connections between how kids are learning in what we now call brick and mortar schools and how um, um, kids have so many opportunities to learn uh, out of school and in cyberspace. And the extent to which we have uh, teachers uh, who have the time and space to build those connections uh, 
not just with resources and other teachers from around the, around the world who can be helpful to the kids with whom they're teaching in their brick and mortar buildings, but just as importantly, the kinds of opportunities that the kids need to have outside that 7.30 to 3 o'clock typical school day in after school programs, summer programs, and so forth with nonprofits and social service agencies and the like that are so instrumental to helping so many of our kids, especially our more at-risk kids in America, uh, have access to the kind of teaching and learning that they need. Those community school partnerships need to be driven by classroom teachers uh, who have the time and space to do so. We also believe we need teacherpreneurs because we need a different brand or different sets of brands of teachers, I should say, entering the profession who have a range of skills, uh, both who are both generalists and socialists. I mean, a socialist maybe too. Generalist and specialist, excuse me. Maybe that was a Freudian slip uh, from this uh, uh, left of center of progressive educator here in North Carolina. But <laughs> I didn't mean to say specialist. Um, who need to be orchestrated in very different ways in the best interest of kids. Uh, we need not individual teachers uh, being solely responsible for uh, the uh, individual outcomes that kids um, need to achieve, um, and unlike what we have in the United States now, where most of the focus is on the individual teacher and his or her effectiveness, we need to start thinking about teaching as a team sport. Well, who is going to orchestrate all of those teams and the learning opportunities, not just for kids, but also the many teachers who are entering our profession who need more preparation and support, and, and, and we believe um, that teachers themselves are the best uh, educators of future teachers. Ergo, the teacherpreneur, uh, which was our emergent reality number four, um, where we see this large group of teachers, and we did say 600,000. Again, uh, 600,000 would represent about one in 11 credentialed educator in the United States. And we don't think those numbers are um, uh, too outrageous given the needs of schools and the needs of, of, of uh, kids. So with that in mind, uh, after we produced this book uh, and the, we had some of these bold ideas put out there, uh, we as an organization, uh, a nonprofit based here in North Carolina, but with a virtual reach now all across the world, uh, where we are, have a variety of uh, efforts to connect, ready, and mobilize teachers to transform their own profession, we have raised revenue, mostly from philanthropy, uh, but raised revenue so we could actually buy the time of teachers who, so they could lead without leaving. Uh, and then once we did that, uh, we started writing and le learning uh, uh, about their experiences, writing about and learning from their experiences. And we produced a book uh, just published of about, uh, nine, about six, seven, eight months ago entitled Teacherpreneurs, uh, Innovative Teachers Who Lead uh, Without Leaving. And this book, uh, well, it's hopefully you'll be able to purchase it and read it and so forth. We recognize that not everyone's going to read a book, so we actually then turned to uh, Sonny Brown, who is a terrific animator and uh, storyteller out of Austin, Texas. And um, uh, Sonny uh, helped us develop a three-minute video which captures the big ideas from the book Teacherpreneurs. Steve, I'm going to let you turn the uh, video on, and um, uh, we'll take a look at this and then get into some hopefully some good conversation about the uh, teacherpreneurs and how um, we can take this idea to the video. So if the video doesn't start for you automatically, please go ahead and click play. I'll also put the link in the chat if for some reason it's blocked. Countless studies show that teacher quality is the most crucial in school factor for student learning. What happened here? I don't know if I need to, I wonder if it's something that... Oh, yeah, it's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, Peggy's already written. I lost the video. Um. Oh.
Okay, I just made an executive decision because there were enough people in the chat saying they weren't seeing the video. They wanted me to start it again. I, I'm guessing better to see it twice than to not see it at all. So here we're going to try again. And if this doesn't load for you in play, please do click on the link in the chat and it will load in your own personal browser. And it's about three minutes long. Several studies show that teacher quality is the most crucial and useful factor for student learning. Yet our nation lacks coherent policies to improve teaching quality in the long run. Likely, most American education policies. So we brought you back, and if you weren't able to watch the video, please do watch it from the link. I'll put it in the chat again. I was able to see it from my end. Great. Thank you, Steve. I'm going to quickly just put out a couple of issues and, and kind of hopefully jumpstart the conversation. Um, uh, first, uh, let's say we are not naive uh, about the enormous barriers uh, that are in the way of reaching our goal of 600,000 teacherpreneurs by the year 2030. Um, even though we are proud, for example, we have a partnership in, with the uh, Arizona K-12 Center um, based in Phoenix. I know we have someone here from Phoenix online to, uh, this afternoon. Um, where We are jointly uh, supporting a, a teacherpreneur who's helping us um, not only um, drive um, uh, some interesting reforms in STEM education around the country, but notably working with the teachers union to help them begin to bind this concept of a bolder brand of teacher leadership. And, uh, and we have really some great examples elsewhere of how more superintendents, not, you know, not 13,000 of them yet, um, that's, that's about how many we have in this country, but uh, increasing numbers of superintendents are really getting more interested in this brand of teacher leadership. But there are three major barriers that we speak to uh, in the book, and we alluded to them a bit in the video. One is the fact that the school schedule today, and that we have a number of teachers online here for sure, right now, um, you know better than anyone else, uh, that the way schools are orchestrated, uh, the way the bells are rung, uh, the way the buses um, come and go, um, is pretty much the same way we've always done school schedules, uh, dating back you know, 50, 60 years. And that schedule still values teachers as isolated practitioners more than not. Yes, there are some wonderful opportunities that are emerging with some new designs, but they're not yet at scale. So that's barrier number one. We've got to break down um, the kind of uh, archaic sort of mythology um, that still prevails in most administrative circles about how to organize a school day for kids as well as the teachers who teach them. And by the way, I'll just quickly say there's some wonderful examples uh, from top performing nations around the world that uh, create this type of flexibility for their uh, teaching profession. The other barrier is, and I think this one is um, um, dissipating faster than not uh, right now, and that is the cultural belief that has pervaded the profession for ever since perhaps its inception in 1848 when Horace Mann uh, is known for creating the first normal school that led to the modern day teaching profession that all teachers are basically the same, have the same role and so forth. Uh, Steve, uh, you'll be proud of, um, of this because I think this thing called the internet and the kind of work that you do, and of course I'm sure a lot of work that some of the teachers online here today do, is really breaking down this barrier primarily because the internet's allowing teachers to see others 
in ways they would never uh, be able to see them before. They're able, able to set, share their expertise, not just to fellow practitioners, but to the public in ways that's making more and more people comfortable about the different roles and the different strengths that many teachers have. But there still is a strong cultural belief in many schools that every teacher is the same. You can't have teacherpreneurs if that is the prevailing uh, belief system. And then finally is, uh, and this is not necessarily the case which you find in other countries, um, especially in those top performing ones, but there is the political reality here that as more and more successful teacher leaders surface and teacherpreneurs, uh, they're going to, with their knowledge in the classroom, their knowledge of community, may very well surface inconvenient truths that run, uh, I guess, against the grain of today's school reform narrative. Uh, and I think uh, this is something worthy of conversation and so forth. But here's the thing that makes me so sanguine about the possibilities of overcoming this barrier. Despite the kind of um, lack of respect that so many teachers have in our country um, as um, witnessed by our political system and our policies, 72% of America's public adults have high levels of trust and confidence in today's teachers. Now that 72% figure represents the beliefs of individual um, Americans and their beliefs about individual teachers. Now what we have to do to overcome this political reality is rally more of the American people to translate that belief about individual teachers in their individual communities to the collective of teachers. That gives me hope. And there are other reasons that I have hope, too. Uh, we have more and more teachers, for example, in our virtual community. There were about 100 last year who supported both with compensation and editorial support to start writing publicly about their beliefs and ideas. Over 700 blogs last year were published by CTQ-supported teachers, and now we're helping other organizations uh, take this on as a role to help elevate the voices and ideas of teachers. We also have some terrific examples, and I can not to go into all 17 teachers with whom we supported. Noah Zeitner from Washington is helping develop our virtual community of teacher leaders from around the world. We're getting ready to publish a report under Noah's leadership from, the, from a, a handful or so of teachers who are writing about their professional learning systems and helping um, influence ministers of education, and even foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation about how they're thinking about uh, professional learning systems. And um, the foundation, by the way, is now very interested in the work of Noah and what he's done as a teacherpreneur based in Seattle, Washington. And by the way, Noah was just named World Educator of the Year by the World Affairs Council. We also have Julie Hiltz, who I will tell you this, and a, a colleague of ours from Florida, teacherpreneur in Hillsborough County, which is Tampa, Florida. Uh, probably two years ago, Julie never saw herself as a, a, as a, a teacher leader, much less a teacherpreneur. Uh, she's become a, a tremendous writer uh, and publisher of her ideas. Uh, journalists are starting to pick up uh, Valerie Strauss. Watch, watch for a piece that Julie is just going to be published by Valerie Strauss's. Um, Abigail, what's the name of her piece? Uh, the, the Answer Sheet Blog. Yeah, the Answer Sheet Blog. So Washington, Washington Post. Yeah, Washington Post Answer Sheet, sheet Blog. Mon next Monday, watch for Julie's beautiful essay on uh, what teaching is as part of our campaign, uh, hashtag teaching is, uh, to help uh, communicate to the public about um, the power of good teaching and what good teachers actually do. And then finally, um, I'm going to turn to Laurie Nazarino, who unfortunately is not teaching uh, part of the day anymore. Um, but she uh, is a board-certified teacher, um, like Julie, by the way, and like Noah. Uh, but she's a board-certified teacher who taught many years in Miami, Florida, uh, and started her own nonprofit there while still teaching so that NBCTs, Nationally Board Certified Teachers, had a venue and a vehicle to mentor young teachers. She moved to Denver, Colorado after becoming frustrated by the resistance from both school administration and the union uh, for the work she was doing there. Um, she moved to Denver, Colorado, uh, worked in, in the Denver public schools, became frustrated by their bureaucracy as well, started her own teacher-led school. Uh, we write about Laurie uh, and Noah and our book, Teacher for Nurse, and more on their stories can be found there. But right now, I'm very proud to say Laurie is working with uh, some colleagues, including Ken Ferris-Berg, 
uh, and others to help more and more teachers around this country, while they're still teaching, learn the tricks of the trade, if you will, of how to create your own teacher-led schools. So uh, check out what Laurie's doing. So these are three fabulous examples, uh, Steve, of how uh, teachers are uh, and teacherpreneurs are being in the classroom with both uh, translations of um, their pedagogical practices from uh, classroom to classroom. And by the way, Julie is very much instrumental in spreading good ideas in Florida in our virtual community there. But most importantly, making uh, what good classroom practice looks like more well known from the most trusted source of both teachers and parents for good information, and that's teachers themselves. So um, that's uh, our story in, in, in a nutshell. Uh, it's a movement that uh, we give great credit to Vicki Davis a few years back to kind of coming up with this word. We're trying to make it come to life and help more policymakers, administrators, and teachers themselves embrace this idea and then find the financial wherewithal to figure out uh, how to fund and support this work um, for the long haul. The money actually, despite the terrible financial straits many districts and states find themselves in now, can be found in the system if we got smarter about all the um, administrators uh, and all those administrative roles and supervisory roles that we currently have in, in our system. So with that, I'd love to um, turn it over to you guys for some questions. I think we have a good 30 minutes for conversation. Uh, I'd love to hear your stories uh, and your ideas and figure out how we can join this movement together uh, to transform the profession uh, that makes all other professions possible. Thank you very much to you for the opportunity. Absolutely. So to join the conversation, you can either raise your virtual hand, that's the third icon over in the participant window, and we'll give you the microphone, or you can put a note in the chat. Abigail's put in a previous Washington Post article from Julie. Craig has made a link to a blog post on this movement. Good. It looks like we had someone raise their hand, but they disappeared. If that was you, feel free to put a note in the chat or raise your hand again. You just click a single time on that hand icon. We may be facing midday fatigue. Can I ask you guys a question? Um, now, I really don't know. Uh, I'll pick up a little bit. I know we have some teachers, practicing teachers, uh, in the room, in the house, so to speak. Um, I would love to hear from you specifically um, where you see, you might see a leverage point uh, perhaps um, in a school district in which you're working, um, in an agency in which you're working in, if, you're, um, uh, if you are working in a university, which by the way, imagine if we uh, fuse the funding from school districts and universities and how many teacherpreneurs that could be cre supported, created, funded, uh, if we actually put some of those dollars from higher education uh, and those dollars from school districts um, into the same bucket, so to speak, for this particular role. So I would love to just to see, if, given your own situation, I would love to know about teacher leadership in your context and where you think there might be a leverage point for a bolder brand of teacher leader um, than what we might have now um, uh, in place. And while they're thinking about that, Barnett, Lala Pierce has a question. I don't know if you would like me to read it or if you can see it there. I haven't seen it yet. I'm, I'm maybe it's she says, what has been the climate change from the inception of this movement to now? 
how do policymakers, those entrenched in ed, others respond now to the idea as opposed to how they did it first? Has it improved? <laughs> what a fabulous question. Okay, uh, here's what I think uh, has improved. Um, and, we're not, and we can get a lot more support from the president and, and his secretary of education. And, but at least now there is conversation from Washington, D.C. about the importance of teacher leaders. Um, are, are folks using the word teacherpreneur not in Washington, D.C., not in the innermost powerful circles of education policy? Uh, and we can talk more about that later, I suspect, but there is an enormous number of, of people talking about teacher leadership, talking about it in a very different way. There is an enormous push from some foundations, uh, including, I will tell you, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which has focused in, in the last several years in this country, and they're the world's largest education foundation, on measuring teachers and their effectiveness. They are much more interested now in teacher leadership and the professional learning systems that need to be in place so teachers can spread their expertise. Um, I'm 58 years old, Steve, um, and everyone else. Uh, I, I suspect I'm going to be doing this work until uh, I'm no longer able to do anything. Uh, uh, that's my plan. Uh, but I, will, I, I think we will see teacherpreneur institutionalized, maybe not as boldly and broadly as I, we hope by 2030. Um, uh, when I am 74 years old, uh, but um, I, I think uh, you, you, you will see this, and, I th and it all starts with language and how it's going to be used. But we need more and more teachers clamoring for this and demanding this and talking to the, the public and to those parents who actually trust and have confidence in you. The school reformers, for the most part, already have their ideas. Teacherpreneurs can be a threat to them. They also can be a big help to them. And we're seeing in some cases where in the past, you know, um, teacherpreneurs are now inside, not just inside the door and not just at the table, but they're beginning to lead some of the conversations about reform and the like in ways they haven't done so previously. So I, I'm going to is, is there an inherent tension that exists because in many ways, schools post-1920 were intended to reduce independence and have this legacy of actually not wanting uh, chaos that comes from everybody being independent and the teacherpreneur sort of model? Absolutely. And if there's one thing I would change in the video, Steve, um, because I really do not want to beat up administrators too much on this at all, even though we've had, we face some enormous barriers from administrators who are very much threatened by teacher leaders. But if, remember the, the scene in the video with the, the thumb coming on top of the head of the teacher? Well, we should have had the next scene to be a thumb coming on top of the head of that administrator. Uh, our system uh, is a, uh, a command and control one. And it is designed, and teachers are part of, of that uh, operation, of, uh, of that command and control operation. And if, if we had more teacherpreneurs, there would be the kind of, I would say, organized chaos that could create the kind of inspiration and creativity that you find in many 21st century uh, learning organizations. Um, so um, there's no question that our accountability system, as it's presently construed in this country, undermines this, this concept. There's absolutely no question about it, Steve. Um, but again, um, Craig had a question for you. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, please, Craig. Craig said, I recently encouraged teachers to promote themselves as it demonstrates the good they and their students do. The response was timid. How have you guided timid teachers toward self-promotion? Oh, oh, that is a fabulous insight. Uh, teachers are some of the most humble professionals on the face of the earth, Craig. And that's what makes them so endearing to parents and to their students. 
also, uh, it also is why teachers trust their colleagues so much because they um, come across as this is a shared experience and if we're going to get this thing done, we got to do it together. Of course, that doesn't work in this top-down system, uh, right? So how do you develop what we call in teacherpreneurs amongst growing numbers of teachers what we call intelligent humility, okay? Uh, that, um, and I will say if you re we read the book, I hope you have a chance to read the whole book, uh, in e each of the eight stories we tell, uh, each one of these teacher leaders have that characteristic. How did they develop that? Um, yes, they did develop it primarily by building confidence in themselves and by staying connected to their colleagues, yes, but also by engaging increasingly over time opportunities formally and informally to uh, teach other teachers uh, about some new innovation while the other teachers were expected to teach them simultaneously. I think this is a, it, it is a, I think it's a learned disposition, Steve. And I'll tell you something else that we have found that brings teachers out of their leadership shell. And this is why we invest so much organizationally in teachers as writers, is their capacity, uh, which the teachers are so busy, they don't have time and bandwidth to do the hard work of writing uh, like academics do, right? Or professors do. Um, but if, what we try to do is find that organizational space and give teachers the support so they can go public with their ideas. This helps them in a way develop that confidence um, about who they are and about their capacity to be a leader without being a top-down one. Uh, these are more nuanced sort of dispositions of uh, Craig, uh, but that they are developed and they can be, I think, developed uh, strategically in growing numbers of teachers. It's not for every teacher. Our whole conference, conference model is based on this principle which is we accept 95% of the proposals because we believe that the act of presenting to other teachers is of such significance that it actually changes the, the internal feelings and workings of the teacher such that they can then model for their students being a creator, being an entrepreneur, a teacherpreneur, and being proactive. I, I will tell you, of all the things we do to support the profession and to work with teachers uh, at CTQ, I, I don't think anything is more important than what we've done to help teachers become, go public with their ideas. Yeah, it's very interesting, right? If you ask a teacher, should your students have a website? Should they have a portfolio? Should they be able to, to demonstrate who they are in very uh, tangible ways? They'll all say yes, and then you'll ask them, are you doing this yourself? Oh, I could never do that. I feel awkward about it. And there is something that actually changes, I think, cognitively in that act of shifting. Yeah, I mean, I think, Craig, going back, helping teachers, and we actually do some of this, by the way, uh, in very private space, so teachers can practice. I am good at this and why. <laughs> so they end up doing this in private space before they go public uh, in their particular venue, whether they're, they're leading a virtual learning community for their state or a um, professional development uh, series in their district, uh, or uh, in the case of getting in front of uh, a legislature uh, like uh, Jessica Cuthbertson just did in, in uh, uh, Colorado to turn back an awful piece of uh, legislation. And by the way, she and her colleagues, her teacher colleagues, were very successful in uh, turning back a very regressive piece of uh, legislation in the state around 21st century teaching. Sean brings up the question of parents and the pressure they put on politicians and school boards uh, based on the, the test model and the desire for their own children to succeed in that model. How would you address that? Well, this is one reason, uh, Steve, um, we are uh, it's a small nonprofit based in North Carolina is working with the, the teachers union, most notably the National Education Association. National Education Association. Um, we think the union has enormous potential if they shifted their focus just a bit 
and support, supported more of this type of teacher leadership and teachers who could connect with parents in a systematic way. Uh, and parents and teachers and kids themselves joining forces. Like you're beginning to see in, in certain places around the country to push back against this, um, some of the draconian and high stakes accountability system uh, that uh, are in place. But if we can actually get the union to help cultivate more of this type of teacher leader and given their infrastructure, you remember the teachers union are in every state, <laughs> in every school district, and there's representatives in every school. They're not mobilized for this type of work, unfortunately. And I'm not saying this should be their total agenda, but uh, that's their business. Uh, but I will say if they could take on more of this teacherpreneurial agenda, we can get to what your 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 hope I hope I, what it sounds like you're are in, are beginning to envision. Uh, they have enormous capacity to take this idea to scale. I'm a small nonprofit in North Carolina. I can't do it by itself. Has anybody That's done a good job that you've seen in organizing community meetings around teaching and learning um, that have, that have been able to scale or expand? Oh. That, that the latter part makes it difficult. There are, there are incredible examples, I mean, and not just of late, but for decades of teachers working with parents to mobilize around a certain issue. But those structures kind of come and go. And one reason they come and go is because most of those types of efforts are fueled by small nonprofits uh, with very little resources with no kind of institutional structure in place to sustain them over time. Um, and that is um, why, again, I think the unions are so important. Uh, and if they could, for example, um, you know, Dennis Van Roke, I'll just give you an example. He's the president, the outgoing president of the NEA. Last year at their annual meeting, got a, um, a resolution passed where every one of their three million plus members um, paid an additional $3 in dues. And that is going to, uh, I wish it was going to all to teacher leadership, but a lot, some of it is going to their efforts to try to cultivate teacher leaders and to bring positive change and to work with uh, communities like what you're describing. Just imagine, instead of $3 uh, per member we use for this purpose, Steve, what if, um, even $30 was used for this purpose. And I think, I'm not sure how many union members are on the, the online tonight, teacher union members, but you know, I think the union, do, that would be like 10% or maybe uh, even less of a member's dues. If it could go to this type of mobilization, it could make a big, big, big difference. Have you seen a community visioning process that you liked? You know, we actually worked with a district, uh, and, I, and I mean, I can, there's lots of great examples that I don't know nearly enough about. Uh, but we actually worked with in Jefferson County, Colorado, a few years back, to help them think through a teacher leadership and compensation system that would primarily drive the um, the um, expertise of teachers and spread teaching expertise. It wasn't a perfect system when it was all said and done they got launched. But here's what happens, and this is typical what happens. It was a really powerful process. It took about 15 months. There were school board members, you know, parent meetings, a small design team that got a lot of education about best practices from around the world and so forth. And they designed a really good model. They got a big federal grant to help implement it. Guess what happens? The school board changes its political sort of leanings. Uh, the superintendent's gone. The union leader, who was fabulous in the process, went on to work for the state and is now the state association leader as opposed to the local leader. Uh, and all that good work uh, is going down the tubes. And this is the, one of the enduring, unfortunate, unfortunately, but one of the enduring stories of, of really positive school reform in this country. So if you have a question or a comment for Barnett, you can put it in the chat, or some brave soul will yet raise their hand to take the microphone. <laughs> 
Yeah, it could be may I ask Abigail uh, if you were familiar with the work of Pam Moran and Iris Silkall in Abermarl for this school district in Virginia. I think you'd really connect with them and they're doing some work that probably is so close to yours or where they're actually doing it district wide that that might be a fun connection. There's some great comments, Steve, in the box. Elizabeth Bottoms from Vienna. Uh, uh, love, I mean, can I um, um, put you on the spot, Elizabeth, and ask you to speak a little bit more about um, uh, to work in your work at the Vienna International School and um, how the expectation is for teachers to um, kind of get out of the box, so to speak, and I'd love to know about the time that you have to do so. Elizabeth, to turn your mic on, you just click on the talk button that's immediately below Barnett's image. There you go. Yes. There you go. Hi. Yeah, um, I'm in a really lucky position. I love, I've just become second in the department, and when I applied for the job, they asked me to take this um, middle-level leadership course and now they're asking every single teacher in the school to take this course, even if they're not in a leadership position. And they just want all the teachers to think about what are you good at. And let's see how you can use that. And what you're not good at, don't worry about it. Somebody else will be able to cover in your department for it. So um, I really I had a lot of fun this year so far. We are a group of six in our department. And we just see the drama teachers and music teachers. And we swap over classes. Or we come into each other's classes when you know, oh, I'm not really that good at this aspect of the teaching. And it just only works because we really trust each other. But we had a great time so far this year. Uh, Elizabeth, how much time do you have? How many uh, hours a, a, a week do you teach lessons to teach your students? And how many hours do you have time to do this type of leadership work? Yeah. I've got 21 hours of teaching. I've got two hours really for being in performing arts because we do a lot of evening stuff. And I've got two hours to be um, to do all the leading stuff. And the average teacher in America teaches about 30 hours of lessons. Um, um, in Singapore, um, teachers teach somewhere between 12 and 18 hours of lessons. In Shanghai, it's from nine hours to about 15 hours. And in Finland, it's about 12 to 18 hours. I'm in a very, um, very fortunate position. I mean, next year, my lessons are yes, going to go well, up because they shortened the, the lesson. So it's going to go up to 24. But still, it's, um, it's feasible. Yes, uh, but, but you know, if we organize, one of the things that I like to point out in the, in the United States, uh, about 45% um, of all credentialed educators are, are actually teaching children in other countries, and they tend to be the ones that do the best on international measures of student achievement. There are somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of all credentialed educators are actually teaching children, um, and so uh, and in and in, in their high need school, the uh, ratios are even better in terms of the numbers of adults that are actually teaching kids and working with kids, um, and we just don't have that uh, to be the case here in, in the United States. Um, teachers. Uh, it, it, teaching is a very complex enterprise, and in many, in so many contexts, increasingly, uh, not just in so-called high-impact communities, it's serving many, many impoverished children. And America has too many impoverished children. Well, it goes without saying. Uh, it is a shameful situation that in America, one in, one in four children are impoverished in our schools. Um, but. That, that, that said, um, we can still do more to dedicate more time for teachers to, uh, quite frankly, lead uh, without leaving if we had fewer administrators who did, more, who, who did less supervising and those roles turned into more of these hybrid roles. Oh, by the way, another really fun fact from uh, this recent MetLife poll, in America, 23% 
of teachers, and that would equate to about 700,000 teachers, 23% reported that they are very or extremely interested uh, in um, these hybrid roles uh, like uh, teacherpreneurs that we described. I know we're getting close to the uh, four o'clock hour, but you know, please see. Could you see the uh, question from Lala? Uh, if you could instantly create or magically change one thing, what would it be? What do you see as the most pressing need that teacherpreneurs could affect? It's, it's, oh, that's a great question. If there was one thing I would do, it would have to be going to this issue I was just, uh, I think, alluding to. It would be to take all the money in the system and figure out how all those administrators and supervisors who don't teach children, all those people positions, okay, could go into classroom teaching positions so that more teachers could lead something without leaving the classroom. And more people who have authority in the system are working with children. And as a result, uh, we finally get to the point where we blur the lines of distinction between those who teach in schools and those who lead them. Lead, lead them. That is, so this is one thing is to get administrators back, in those administrative roles and people back into these hybrid roles and so that more teachers can lead without leaving. The teachers themselves will create the teacher promoter roles. And once they start having the time to spread their expertise, uh, having time to see each other teach, think about each other's practice, do some of the kind of work that Elizabeth's doing in her small team. But what if Elizabeth had only 14 hours of teaching lessons and, uh, uh, and nine hours of, of, of leadership work? Uh, and what if some of that leadership work that allowed Elizabeth to, to spend more time with teachers all across the world? Uh, think about what, what the benefits that would bring to kids and to all the teaching colleagues. Hey, we have three great sessions coming up. I think we should close. Carol did put a m message there in the chat, Barnett, if you wanted to respond. Um, so I don't want to stop you from doing that, but uh, maybe that could be our last one. Okay, and, and the question, I'm sorry. Oh, she's asking again? if we shouldn't add students into this equation, trying to... Oh, brilliant. Absolutely. Absolutely, because, you know, the, you know, more than anything else, um, what, if for teachers to teach and lead the way that they can uh, and could and should, they have to create the same type of learning system for kids. And so, yes, you're exactly right, Carol. Uh, we should uh, think about, uh, we should not think about teacherpreneurism and how we orchestrate um, time and learning and leadership uh, for them as well as, as when we think about uh, teachers themselves. What a br brilliant and very thoughtful and most notable uh, addition to the concept. Thank you, Carol. And thank you, Barnett. And all of you who have been here, it was a, as Abigail said, there was great energy and discussion. Most appreciated. Um, I'm going to leave the slide up here so that you have the contact information. We'll give you a couple of minutes to get to the next set of sessions. Thanks, Barnett. Really nice to hear from you again. Let, let the revolution begin. <laughs> Better yet, continue. <laughs> Those of you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you. Hope to see you online. Me too. Bye-bye. Okay,